Learn the most advanced recruiting techniques. Land the most desirable talent. Launch your company towards massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. All right. Well, everyone is chasing the same people, i.e. those who work for competitors or the three to seven year up and comers. There is a huge pool of talent that are on the sidelines waiting for a well-positioned opportunity to present itself. I'd like to challenge you to adopt the concept that outstanding talent comes from the most unlikely places. Last week, we heard the story of a top sales performer at swag.com who had no sales experience at all but the desire alignment was through the roof. And now this person is absolutely thriving in their organization. This creativity and outside the box thinking is what sets the stage for hiring success. Today is all about hiring outstanding salespeople in an environment that is ridiculously competitive. I'm Rick Gerard and welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. We help entrepreneurs and executives win the strongest hires by sharing insights from top performing rebel entrepreneurs, game changers, and industry leaders, like our guest today, Mr. Chris Beal. Chris is the CEO of Connect and Sell. For 30 years, Chris Beal has led software startups as a founder or early stage developer. He believes the most powerful part of a software system is the human being and the value and the value key is to let the computer do what it does well. Go fast without getting bored in order to free up human potential. Chris and his team provide a software as a solution for sales teams to talk more prospects. And he hosts a podcast, Market Dominance Guys, which is what makes Chris the perfect expert for today's topic. Chris, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show today. Uh, Rick, great to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. So we've we've had some off-camera time, and we talked a, a, a bit last week. And so we're going to talk about a, a problem that I actually had a call about earlier in the week. I think it was yesterday, where somebody was saying, "Hey, look at I'm I'm drowning here. I can't find salespeople." So it was uh, it was really a timely conversation. So I said, "Well, tune in tomorrow because we're going to be talking about that." Um, so we're going to discuss why you're looking in the wrong places for sales talent. And then we're going to talk about how to adapt your hiring model to uncover high-performing salespeople. Sound like a plan? Fabulous. All right, let's do it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the challenges um, that you are seeing or hearing from out there, uh, maybe similar to what, what I'm hearing on my end. Well, I, th I think there's two big ones. I mean, one is the one you've referred to, which is, that suddenly the war for talent is a war of all against all. You know, it used to be you fought for talent in sales, especially with your actual competitors. That is the people, the companies you competed with in the marketplace were the companies you competed with for talent. Yeah. And the talent tended to be nailed in place physically to some degree, especially those people who are in the meat of their careers, their families, um, they've got you know kids in school. And suddenly, boom, you know, overnight, they can work for anybody anywhere. So that's that's new. And I don't think people have gotten used to it yet. People running companies, especially. I know one CEO likes to count cars in the parking lot. You know, it's like, when are they all going to come back? Well, <laughs> it, they're not. There are so, no cars yeah. in the parking lots anymore. It's great. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> that, that ship has sailed. The other one is everybody's trying to figure out the model. You know, do I have some people call it or, or set appointments for other folks on my team. So the SDR model, two tier, one tier, you know, how do I do this stuff? And if I do adopt one of these models, like I, I'll have folks who are setting appointments, SDR teams, who do I get? How do I get them? What's the right kind to get? And sometimes they'll gravitate towards you know, a, a bunch of people are good at sending emails, but they can't actually set appointments that just getting the talent lined up with what your needs actually are is really, really, really hard. And I think people bail out often and just go for a quantity play. It's like, let's take a bunch of people fresh out of school and see if we can develop them. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned SDR. Let, let, let's start there really quick. What is SDR for those of us who are not uh, sales proficient? Yeah. So there's this thing called an SDR, a sales development rep, who essentially works at the top of the funnel to set appointments for account executives who actually close business. Yep. So the idea is that you can get somebody who's a little lower priced 
you can get more of them that you might be able to get them more easily and you can develop them into account executives. So this is often seen as a way station kind of job, a stepping stone. Uh, although there are folks who see the SDR uh, job as much more of a professional job, venture capital, especially in Silicon Valley has driven this movement. And I think part of it is venture capitalists like to have something they can spend money on or make you spend money on that they can see. <laughs> and they can sure see a bunch of SDRs, right? You can count the heads and go, look how many we have, and you know, how many hours a day they're working, all that kind of good stuff. It doesn't matter if they're not closing deals. <laughs> we just want to have more headcount in here, right? Oh, yeah. I had a conversation once with the head of sales development of a company in the insurance industry that will remain nameless. And I said, hey, you know, if I could show you how instead of hiring 450 people, you could get the job done with 50, what would you think? And he said, Chris, my job is to hire 450 people. That's what the VCs want me to do. That just doesn't make any sense to me, but hey, you know, it's their money, right? Um, <laughs> they want you to burn through it. All right. So uh, besides besides the fact that, you know, kind of everybody's chasing the same type of people, uh, what are the other challenges that uh, people are facing in, in hiring sales talent? Well, it's a long, long ramp time. I mean, you get them on board and then there's this, uh, I'll call it the forever ramp time. And I think actually the equation is quite interesting. So the average salesperson lasts about 17 months before they move on or are moved on. And if you look at people's LinkedIn profiles, you'll see this pattern over and over and over. One year, four months, one year, seven months, one year. It's like over and over and over. There they are going from one place to another, right? So if it takes you, say, six to eight months to onboard somebody, and then it takes you another, say, three or four months to ramp them, or maybe even more than that, to where they're at full quota, they're kind of gone before they're really doing anything, before they're producing. And I think that treadmill is is uh, very challenging, right? And then with sales development reps, you kind of feel like with SDRs, maybe there's a way out of this, right? We could hire them and, and get them up to speed faster. And it turns out you can, but you have to adopt a different approach than is generally used. But usually that's even three or four or five months where, you know, here's somebody's coming on board, all they're gonna do is set appointments, but they're being taught everything about the company's history, everything about every product, how they price, how their competitors work, blah, 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 blah. And then they only last about nine months on average and then they're gone. So why is that though? Because I like there's this churn and burn that happens in on the sales side all the time, right? And it seems to me that you would like to put, you, you should be putting processes in place to ensure that number one, you're not just loading up hires are going to bounce in, in, you know, a year, right? You want them to be there at least two to three years so that they actually make an impact within the organization, right? Um, why not shift the model to, <clears throat> rather than throwing bodies in, into seats and hoping that they work out into let's hire less with and, and get better results. Well, I think part of it's tradition, you know, the, the tradition <laughs> of industrial capitalism, the way we've played the game for a long time, 150 years or so, has been that you give a rep a territory. This is sales management, right? Hire somebody, give them a territory. If they don't work out, fire them. Tell them more stories along the way about how great you were when you were a salesperson. That's yeah, sales yeah. management. And we've all seen it. Right? And I think there's probably a lot of people listening to this who go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen that before, right? Yeah, but and that's what makes people bounce. That's what makes them bounce. And, and yeah. it's a tradition that comes out of the purpose of sales. The old purpose of sales was to dispose of inventory at a profit. And mm -hmm. the inventory would build up otherwise because your factory is making more widgets or whatever and you got to get rid of the damn things and you know turn them into margin uh, into gross profit that comes back to the business interestingly in the innovation economy that's not the purpose of sales at all the purpose of sales is to go actually be, forge your way into markets dominate markets organic growth is not just numbers it's markets you got to go take markets so you know folks haven't shifted from that old model because managers tend to be the older people in companies and the executives running companies often kind of yearn for the good old days, right? Get a good rep, put them in a territory. They got their business, let them run their business. Right. And that stuff just doesn't work anymore. And when you try to, apply it, yeah, exactly. 
So that's part of it. And then part I think is in the, in the absence of knowledge of what can work, people just kind of go with what they know they can do, which is hire people. So for instance, Dave Curlin, one of the greatest people in the world of, of helping folks hire great sales folks, he has this test called the OMG, the Objective Management Group test. And it's very, very objective. And it'll tell you pretty much whether your rep's going to work out or not for that particular sales job. But, you know, if you run his test and, and it's very hard to game, then you have to kind of believe the results and go with it. And I think folks would rather go with their gut. It just feels funny to hire somebody based on objective knowledge. And I believe that most folks hire sales reps that are like themselves. And I think that's a huge, huge issue. They so hire the based on likability. Yeah, they hire yeah. based on likability or, or whether or not uh, the person like relates to them in some sort of way. It's, it's completely bias ridden 90% of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the, the final piece, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart because uh, I've learned a lot about it the last two years. So I don't, I probably mentioned to you that I'm engaged to the incomparable Helen Fanucci, who is a sales manager at Microsoft. That's what she calls herself. Her accounts are really, really big. So I think, you know, the biggest of the big, right? And she's got five of them and you know, 12 people report to her or something like that, about 700 people on her extended team. I watch her manage and it's real management and nobody leaves that team. Nobody. Yeah. And the reason is that she applies real management principles, not just put them in a territory and hope they work out, not just harp on the number. I've never once heard her talk about the number, not once, but really... Um, her, her principle, which I love, is called love your team. Because sales is so difficult and because your own organization is likely to get in the way more even than, than competitors, right? we all know when we're selling, everybody knows internal friction for the sales process can be maddening. You jump through all these hoops. You spend a lot of time banging data into a CRM. You're doing all the stuff that doesn't feel like sales. And meanwhile, who's clearing the roadblocks for you? It's kind of like, it's almost like you're, you're in the territory, you're on your own. Oh, by the way, the biggest challenge in the territory is our own organization and how hard we are to work with internally. So real sales management, I've, I've learned, is not a myth. I believed it was a, a myth for 40 years. And I've, I've seen it now and I've seen what can happen. So I, I think folks have got to learn a little sales management. Well, if you're not going to die, right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that most organizations, they they most organizations that I come in contact with have a very high bar on the engineering and product side and, and every, every other aspect of the organization. And when a sales manager comes in that doesn't build a, a strong, cohesive team, they usually get rid of them pretty quickly. So I, th I think you're right. Like we, we've, we've hit this precipice where things have changed and especially for salespeople, it's not all about the numbers anymore. It's about the things that really matter that are valuable to the organization. Right. And That's I think the way point. we, the way we do things have done things traditionally leads to another problem, which I see in spades, which is the lack of alignment between sales management and sales leadership and the company. So you often get a situation where the sales leader is looking for their next job and they're trying to do what they can within this one, but you know, maybe it's year two, year three, quota has been raised to some unreasonable level. They feel like it's just not going to work out. They start taking a short timer attitude when they're no longer really a short timer. That cancer just grows in the organization and that churn creates churn. It's kind of self-feeding in, a, in yeah. a certain way. So it, it's a, you know, it's the hardest part of the business to run. It's the part where you have the least knowledge of what's going to work out. I hire a great engineer. I know I got a great engineer. Maybe something might happen with their health, their family or whatever. But other than that, I got a great engineer. If they're great on day one, they're great on day two, day three, day four. I can hire a lucky sales rep. It's entirely possible. You look at somebody's track record and maybe they got lucky. And I don't get to see their performance as an actual performance delivering results for quite a while. That long lag time, I think, creates problems. Well, there's two things. You know, you talked about management. The, the truth is that leadership on the sales side should be in alignment with the organization from a values perspective first. So there should be diligence that goes into hiring a sales leader above and beyond, hey, what are your numbers? And that's how we evaluate 
uh, sales leaders as well. And then, um, you know, you mentioned sales reps. Again, I think it's more and more important today that people align with the values of the company. And there's a lot of really good data out there that, 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 that points to the fact that when you take more diligence in that hiring process, that you're going to have a much greater level of success when you, when you have some North Star behind your hiring process, right? That you understand or a way to evaluate people that are going to align with the company. Yeah, and I've seen some stuff recently, I won't say where, that's been really, really interesting. So I know of a situation where some very senior sales leaders have been brought in from companies that are known for their aggressive sales tactics. And uh, in fact, one of the companies in question, I attended a meeting in Singapore once where the, the leader looks at one of his direct reports, and, and this was his only question, how much money did you take from the customers this week? Now, those values might not align with your values when you're hiring, right? But this person could be tempting, you know, a high performer at a previous company. So one of the things I think you find in sales leadership hires is you're often importing the culture of where this person learned sales, not even where they learned sales management, but where they learned sales. And those cultures can be radically different from yours. And now that culture comes in and, uh, you have a values alignment problem without even knowing it because you you hired what felt like a high performer into a, yeah. into a leadership position. That is a huge mistake. All right. You're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm your host, Rich Gerard. And for our podcast listeners, we're going to take a quick educational moment from our sponsors. Hey, check out stridesearch.com. There you'll find additional content and resources and your link to ordering our, my new book, Healing Career Wounds, which is available now on Amazon. Let it be your startup secret weapon to hiring the strongest people. Today, our guest is uh, Chris Beal. He's the CEO of Connect and Sell, and we're discussing hiring sales reps. So we talked a little bit about some of the problems and some of the reasons why it's important to a company to, to really pay attention to this. So Chris, let's delve into it. So how do we do this? How do we, let's give the audience some sort of um, model in which they can plug it into their business and they can really start evaluating reps or finding reps um, first off that that maybe outside of what they perceive to be their target you know salesperson yeah well one thing i think we could all do maybe in other areas too and certainly in sales is let's look at some different age demographics and this is especially true ironically at the top of the funnel so I, I'm just looking right now uh, off, I'll, I'll look off camera here for a moment because I'm looking at a screen and I won't share the screen, but I'm looking at four sales reps whose ages are somewhere between mid fifties and mid seventies. These are fresh hires at a tech company and the tech company is selling very, very high tech stuff, but selling into the world of hospitals. And so here these four people are, they're, they're you know, later in their career. They might even be thought to be post-career. And their job is to set appointments for the account executives who are traveling and going to these medical facilities and selling this, this uh, stuff. They're the highest performing sales development team that we've seen, I think, ever, other than one particular one that I happen to know about. And, and yet most people would never go look at that demographic. They go, huh, yeah. why would I do that? Or they're not 25 years old. They're, you know, they're, they're not up on all the latest technology, all sorts of reasons to disqualify them. But I can tell you two things about them are fabulous. One is they work and they're very comfortable working, you know, working during the day. The other is they have great confident voices. These are people who've been around. And I think it's hard to appreciate if you've been around in an industry, especially in the industry into which you're selling, and you know that that lingo, you know the problems that they have, and then you've got the confidence of actually having done things there. It's fairly straightforward to learn how to at least set appointments there. So that's that's something I think we should all think about is there's a massive, massive number of folks out there who are, I'll be frank, who are my age or are above, right? right. I don't mind being open about this. So I turned 67 in two weeks and I'm not quite ready to go work for somebody as a sales development rep, but if you could have me, you should, by the way, I'm not bad. Um, <laughs> That's your next career. 
Yeah, that would be my next my next gig, but but I know the uh, guy who runs Connect and Sell, just in case you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but here in my neighborhood that I'm in right now in Quail Creek, Arizona, I would be willing to bet there are out of 2,400 homes, I bet you could find 150 great candidates who have some sort of connection to the industry you're selling into and who would love to spend some time, a few hours a day, setting appointments for your great account executives. And I tell you, that solves a raft of problems right there. You also get great cultural alignment because these are people who are used to adapting to life situations. And you get a kind of interesting stability. Yeah, you know, there may be some health issues here and there, but much less often are they gonna kind of jump ship, go somewhere else, you know, have a career change moment, all those kind of things that happen to people. And uh, there's a lot of satisfaction that that uh, people of that age also get. So, all right, what's know, the, what's the longevity that you get work. from those people? So, I'm sorry. Um, what's the longevity that you get from the team? I mean, I, I would imagine they're not itching to get out. Have Have they been with you for a long time? Well, the ones that I have have. So, my own sales development team at Connect and Sell is uh, more mature than most, and uh, we. We have we had one retirement for health reasons after about seven years. Uh, average tenure is about six, seven years in that group. And, you know, they love what they're doing. It's fun to talk with people. Now, we arm them to the teeth with technology so that they get to talk to 50 people a day without any effort. But that's a kind of a side. You know, the, the main thing is it's a pleasurable job if you're good at it and it doesn't involve travel. <laughs> some people are at a stage of their life where travel just is not that appealing. Yeah. And I'm, it, I'm sure people can do it from home. Right. So it doesn't, it do, it's, it's not that, uh, it's not that difficult for them to plug in and just start producing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, that, you know, that's part of it. Another thing that I think is a, a I'll call it a false economy is, there is a notion that if you are going to hire people for the top of the funnel, that they need to leave eventually and become account executives, that it's not a it's not a real professional job. And each one of the jobs I see in sales, whether you're a hunter, whether you're a farmer, whether you're an appointment setter, they kind of are specialties that that fit some people and don't fit other people. Now, if you're a great hunter, a great closer, you're probably not going to be the world's best. Uh, farmer of relationships, making sure everything's going great. No. That that farming job is a mix between kind of teacher and concierge and a bit of taskmaster. And you've got to be able to do all those things and still close, but you're not closing with strangers. You're closing with, with people who trust you already. You're, you're closing with friends, which is actually hard. But, you you know, you it's a different kind of job from, from the hunter who, yeah, they want you to succeed. Sure, as a customer, right? But great closers are always willing to sacrifice the immediacy of the relationship for the deal because time is too precious. And then great appointment setters, these are people with deep belief in the value of the meeting, even if they don't know that much about the product. And they've got great voices and great, vo uh, you know, great voices are rare. So when you can find somebody with a great voice who likes to set appointments, Man, I don't care how you organize. Just go ahead and snap them up and have them set appointments because that's that stuff other people don't have to do. That's very true, and I would and it keeps the hunters and you know keeps their funnel full and it keeps them happy and it keeps them engaged and keeps them there, right? Because when when AEs jump, it's usually because the funnel is not filling up enough. Yeah, and when companies fail, it's normally their funnels aren't full enough at the sales level and their pipelines are weak. I mean, let's face it. If we knew in advance, everybody was going to buy from us, we wouldn't need a sales team. We just send them a note. Time to buy. Right. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Sales is 95% a process of discovering who is ready to buy in a reasonable time frame, And then 5% of it is other stuff. But it's exactly. really a process of discovering something true in the market. That's the only way to find out is to go engage and talk. Yeah. It, uh, to me, that's, that's the, same the same as hiring, hiring. you know, yeah. hiring it, or locating and recruiting talent and hiring them has to do with are, is the timing appropriate? And is there a, or is this person at a point in their career where we have something to offer that can 
heal their career wounds. They can help them to move forward. Right. None of which is discoverable except by talking with them. I mean, this is the strange conceit um, of the modern world is that Google will do all of your work for you and that you don't have to talk to people. I was talking to a, a guy who's, um, who's a big guy in the world of commercial insurance. And I asked him, what's driving you crazy? And he said, it's this. I keep running into folks who say, I shouldn't have to educate people about insurance. I'm a sales rep. They should be educated by Google. It's Google's job to educate them. Like, no, that's not the issue. The issue is you don't know enough about them and their, the nuances of their circumstance. I mean, your book is actually going underneath people's circumstances to a reality, right? Everybody has career wounds. Yep. And getting that match of an opportunity that gives them an opportunity to heal those career wounds. You know, that's the... That's the service on top of the job that you offer when you get that click to happen. You can't find that stuff out by looking in LinkedIn. I can't discover your career wounds by looking in LinkedIn. It just ain't going to happen. Nor can you if you're having people jump through hurdles like, you know, doing assessments and, you know, sending a resume. Like you can't read any of this on a resume either. You can't tell if somebody's really good at their job by looking at a resume because it's just a poor tool tool to uh to judge somebody by you know i found that really a lot of good people have terrible resumes because they're busy working they're busy doing things they don't want (laughs) to sit down and write a resume right 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 and i actually i've I've found throughout my entire career the highest performers are the worst self-promoters they do not self-promote well at all no and you know, then it, I have certain things I look for, like <clears throat> if somebody in an interview says that they're proudly they they self-promote and say they're a team player. Well, you know, I'm a team player. I just go, no, you're a parasite. I'm not going to hire you because if you have to say you're a team player, you're out. But mm-hmm. we, we assume that we're playing on the team, right? That's like there's something in your background that makes you feel like you've got to say this. And uh, I, I hire for non-parasites. That's my number one thing I look for <laughs> is to Got avoid it. hiring a parasite. It was probably in genuine the way they said it. That's uh, that's what scared you away, right? That's All right. So <laughs> we've got these two pieces, which would be change your model and then identify people who come from the industry to you sell to, which is that untapped talent pool, right? So what about the interview itself? Gosh, I think interviewing salespeople is a is a funny business. Um, there's so many folks who come across well in interviews, and they have huge gaps in their in their ability to run a sales process. So one thing I want to know from somebody is what is the your ideal sales process? You don't know what ours is, but what's yours? And then what's the hard part? What's the hard part? Where where do you you know where when you get to that part do you go? Hey, this is this is where I you know, like it's anything else, sales is pretty athletic. We all have our, our blind spots, our weak spots as as athletes, right? If you're a golfer, mm-hmm. there's some part of your game that's that's the weak part. That's I my whole game. I was practicing <laughs> chipping. Yeah, yesterday I went over and, and went to the, you know, went to get my golf game going for the winter here. And, and I hit 150 chips of which three probably were adequate. Well, I know where my weak part is, right? And I know how I, I try to manage my game away from it as best I can. You can't get away from that part, by the way, in golf. But I want to know, how do they think about the process? I don't want to hear about the war stories, the great things they sold, the big deals they did, all that. I want to know, do they understand that that there is a process, that one needs a process, and how do they think about it? How, how do they think about it? And then how do they feel about how they fit into that and are they realistic about where they're going to need help? Because if you're not realistic about where, where you're going to need help, it's like, I'm Superman. I do everything. Like, okay. So now you're not a parasite. You're a charlatan. Excellent. Right. We got rid of you also. So we're good. We're good. No parasites, no charlatans. <laughs> we'll be left with some that we have a chance. And then the other thing that we like to do, and not everybody thinks this is a great idea, but we like it, is let's hear them talk to customers, our customers. So we have an advantage being connected. So we have this machine where you push a button and talk to somebody. So we'll sit them in the seat for about an hour and they'll have eight to 10 conversations and they'll sell our product and they won't sell it knowing nothing. We'll give them a script and they can, you know, practice it a little bit. But what we're listening for is that voice because in sales, 
let's face it, you know, it, it's like in basketball, I'd rather have a tall person than a short one and a fast one than a slow one. And those kind of characteristics in sales tend to come out in the voice. It's the voice that has got, it's, it's the equivalent of, of the God-given part, right? Do you have a voice that when people listen to you, they are both a little more relaxed and a little more energized and it makes them curious, then it's okay for you to push them a little bit without pissing them off. And we know that when we hear yeah, it, yeah. because you hear it, you're actually using the other person, the prospect as the calibration instrument. So you can go to, you know, OMG and have them take the big assessment, you get something back. This is an assessment that is actually executed by the prospects. How they respond tells you how good that person's voice is. That's so cool. You know, you mentioned two things earlier that I think are really key. One, scripts, right? The ability to sit and be okay with reading the script is pretty important, especially if they're doing phone work. Um, yeah. You know, that's been that's been our business for a long time, and and I, I couldn't tell you the amount of people that I've had come through my organization that didn't want to memorize or internalize a script, especially when it's proven the words work and it you know it. It, it works. I mean, it works, right? Uh, you're giving somebody the tool to work. Um, the second thing is just digging into the, you know, asking the right questions when you do bring somebody in, like walk me through the process of how you closed your next de last deal. Something like that. It's That's a simple question you can ask to really get to the root of how well somebody understands their sales process yeah. and then dig under the hood. But shoot, um, Chris, we're getting pretty close on time. What would be two or three key takeaways you can give the audience if you can plug into their business today? Open your mind to other demographics when you're hiring. Uh, salespeople are, are everywhere. You know, they're like mathematicians. They're in all parts of life. And you don't know by looking at them, uh, but you sure can find out fairly quickly by talking with them and asking them to talk with your customers. And that that's a pretty simple thing to do. Number two is, sales management's a real thing embrace real real management when you manage salespeople. not put them in a territory and see if they work out you know if you're going to have a, i look at it like this we're all on a pip you know pips performance improvement plans all we're all on all day every day all of us we're trying to improve performance so do that from the beginning pay attention to process with people that you hire and find out their gaps and be, be yourself as a manager, be a good team player and fill in on those gaps. Don't expect people to do everything. Yeah. Find yeah. out what they're great at, let them do that. Yeah. And you know, you be the one to, to fill in in those holes that they have because we all, we all got them. That's so very true. All right, Chris, thanks so much for your time and investment today. And I wanna welcome you to the Higher Power Radio community. Now, what would be the best way in which members of the audience could find you, your company that, you know, all those good stuff. Sure. I mean, we're out at connect and sell all one word.com. The and is a and D. Uh, I have a podcast called market dominance guys. If you want to know what kind of strange other things, I think they're all in there. 107 episodes or whatever it is. I don't know where we're at yet. And uh, I'm really active on LinkedIn. So I'm easy to find. I'm Chris Beal, CEO of connect and sell people. People find me because I'm annoyingly active on LinkedIn. <laughs> I, I inspire to be like that. So hopefully one of these days, Chris, I'll be like you. All right. I want to thank our listening audience for tuning into this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, Brian Colburn, Andrea Ballin, and Ayla Gerard. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, review, and share after all this shows for you. And we want to continue to make this content workable for your business. You can join the Higher Power Radio community at Higher, H-I-R-E, Power, P-O-W-E-R, Radio, R-A-D-I-O.com. Or you can drop me an email at rickandstridesearch.com. Tune in next Tuesday. Our guest is going to be Leilani Kare. She is the founder and CEO of Be The Change HR. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power Radio. Catch our LinkedIn Live show every Tuesday at noon or download the podcast on iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. We appreciate you joining us on Higher Power Radio with your guide to recruitment success. Rick Gerard. Rick Gerard. Rick Gerard.